Hello everyone. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? I, I hope you are not the session just before lunch. Uh, but I'll get started because I've been given a heads up to get started immediately. Um, interesting topic. Um, I was once told that it's easier to love a brand when the brand loves you back. But how tough it is to love back. Especially in a world that's so connected, we all have a box in our pockets right now um, that connects us to the world. There's a problem of plenty. There is a problem of, I wouldn't say problem, but multiple challenges. Demographics is different. So I, I'll just open this session with this one question. How tough it is for the brand to love back to anyone? Oh. Actually, it, uh, it depends on, uh, it might not be easy, it might not be easy because consumers are spoiled for choice in every category, there are hundreds and hundreds of brands which are vying for your attention. Uh, but like some of the panelists earlier said, if you focus on the consumers, uh, consumers will love you back. Uh, and it's as simple as that. I can give you, start with a very simple example. Because Thomas Cook has been in the business for such a long time, we've been around for about 140 years. Uh, traditionally and culturally, uh, especially after we got listed, we've always been very performance focused. So uh, most of our spends largely, whether digital or even to a certain extent print advertising, went into performance. So most of the time, we, the language was, uh, for example, if I'm saying selling Singapore, so Singapore eight days would cost you say 80,000 rupees, this is the, what you get. So it was always largely concentrated about, around the what of it. But I think what pandemic changed because consumers got wiser, people were actually uh, now looking for better choices and uh, the category itself degrew. So in for first year, immediately after the pandemic itself, it was the idea was to get people to go out and start holidaying or even think of holiday as a category because they were actually struggling for basic choices of life. And that was one of the most difficult years. That's where we completely changed our approach. Uh, instead of having a transactional conversation about uh, X destination, you get X, Y, Z in, as part of that at this price. Uh, and we actually drove most of it via social because obviously we were budgets are an issue. So a lot of it was, was the idea was to drive organically. Uh, from the conversation of, or transaction conversation moved the con for giving the same example of say Singapore, now, instead of saying that you get this as part of, of, of your Singapore holiday, we, over the years, we had created, curated a, a battery of lot of uh, consumer images, videos, pictures of them holidaying in Singapore. So instead of saying you get this for Singapore, we act, and say you buy Singapore at this and have fun in Singapore, we started showcasing consumer stories about how the, what they can do in Singapore. So instead of showing what you get, we actually showed how you can have fun. These are the examples of how people are showing in Singapore. So if you go and check up most of our timeline, from trying to actively sell, we are now trying to actually say how people are actually having fun in those days. So most of the conversation, and we spent a lot of time, effort, and money to acquire this, whether we generate it via consumers, which is largely user-generated content, or also, uh, also when we use our own people on ground to uh, create this for us. So I think that has made a big change in terms of how our engagement levels on social have gone up, our consumer ratings, our CXI ratings, our, all the scores have, have gone up significantly as compared to what uh, happened in the past. Uh, if you have time, I can give another example, very quickly, completely tangential category because we also have a very large, we are India's largest forex brand as well. So, and student is a very large community for us. So people who are going to study abroad, students who go to study abroad, is a very large burgeoning segment and, and very high ticket value. They pay their university fees and you can imagine it can be anywhere between eight to 10 lakhs at, at the base minimum. And plus they carry our Forex card and they, when they, for their entire tenure of one or two years. So, uh, so it's a very highly engaged audience with one, but the, uh, but, but the category, if you see as Forex, is very transactional. Paisa lo, paisa do. Aap Indian currency do, uske saath mein dollar, whatever your, whichever country is. So it's very transactional. 
what we did, again, this happened after post-pandemic, we looked at the entire life cycle of students uh, right from the time they started researching. For example, if I am going to Australia, uh, I picked up that destination and looked at everything right from the entire time of they started researching, ki mujhe, which are the top universities in Australia, uh, which are the best courses to go for. Then it would come to how to send your application, how are the best ways to write your essays or, or send an application, how, what is the visa application process, whatever. So you look and what you do when you land, how to get a job there, uh, a part-time job so that you can actually pay for your own education or daily expenses. So we looked at this entire thing, hired experts in the education consultants and built about hundreds of videos, explainer videos, how-to videos on YouTube and on a channel which was called a study buddy, instead of saying that I want to sell to you, we said I want to become a buddy of yours in this process and this product or the channel itself was called study buddy which then eventually also now has launch, been launched as a forex card itself. Uh, so that actually changed the entire game for us. So now instead of trying for us to go and reach out to students for and advertising them to acquire, we started featuring when they started researching for their, uh, their education itself. And that really changed the game. In fact, in the last one, uh, one and a half, two years, with the category that for us itself has grown by 100, and 150%. So, so essentially, if you look at it from a consumer's point of view and not try to actively sell, but try to add meaningful difference in their lives, I think it, it is relatively easier. But it's easy to say, it is easier said than done. It, it took us a pandemic for us also to figure it out. Uh, because it's almost, well, it was like a, a struggle for survival itself. For anyone else? Yeah. Start? So I completely agree with what Avinashi said. I would like to just add the life insurance perspective to this. So it's not the era where we can just talk about our product, what our product offers you. It's the era where you need to understand them provide them knowledge, add the value, talk to their needs and at the end of the funnel or the stage comes where you put your product in front of them. So for example, buying a life insurance policy, uh, the communication will not be this is my product, this offers you this, this is the premium you pay. It has to start from what life stage the customer is, how much will you need 10 years with the growing inflation, how much will your family require in case something unfortunate happens. So it's also about, you know, educating them, uh, knowing their pain points, what are their triggers, what are the barriers, uh, what are the, you know, their lifestyle like, talk to them, educate them, add value, what is life insurance, how much do you need, how much cover, what is according to your life stage, lifestyle, annual income. So that education, that value add is the complete process and that is at the end of the funnel we talk about our product, that is when the brand love is built. If the brand is coming to me and just talking about selling the product, I will not love that brand. But if the brand understands me, understands my pain points, talks to me, I am like, oh, I can resonate with this brand. They know what I need. So that is when how you build the brand love. Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with uh, Maharshita. We also come from like life insurance. We are a life insurance brand. And um, uh, what we have realized is, you know, a uh, lot of new audiences find this category very complicated. And today is the time we have been talking about, you know, creating thumb shopping content. And the speed of that thumb swiping and sliding the content is uh, increasing year on year. Uh, so what's working really for us is, as, as Harshita mentioned, it's, uh, you know, creating relatable and snackable content, but we have realized this short vertical videos um, uh, are giving us a good result when those are shot on mobile phone in the real setting and then you are communicating with your audience. Uh, is, is more authentic, is um, actually uh, giving us seven times more completion rates than our other video campaigns. And we are segmenting it very nicely between, you know, Gen Z's and uh, Millennials. So for Gen Z's, we, we try to keep very light-hearted, entertaining or educational, as she mentioned. Um, uh, and for Millennials, our entire goal, like we did a, a longevity campaign recently, we try to add value um, in either informational or a motivational way. And the campaign revolved basically for Millennials around, you know, um, uh, uh, some real life, uh, life changing stories of personalities like Dinesh Mohan who dealt with depression and um, um, then became a, became a model. So we are trying to tell, you know, connect with audience through emotions uh, when it comes to a more 
uh, evolved audience and uh, for I think Gen Z's it's always entertainment and you know like a snackable relatable stuff that's working for us. So if I understand you're saying that you're speaking to the consumers as the consumers where the consumers are. But uh, Devika this is a question for you. I mean brand love is very qualitative right and we all say that uh, we are not here to sell we want to build the brand uh, you know but uh, how do you what is the key metric then to gauge its impact? How do you gauge the impact of brand love? I think that metric will vary for each business but I, I do agree with that with the fact that um, the, it's very important for any business platform service to be able to identify their value proposition uh, for a user, right? And that cannot simply be functional. Um, so I'll respond to your question from uh, our lens, which is Glance as a platform and we see user love on a daily basis, right? Because uh, depending on how much love we get, they spend time on the platform, right? So for, for Glance as a platform, I think it's, it's incredibly important to drive content discovery, which is what we stand for as a, a platform for our users. Um, so enabling discovery of content in a construct that is seamless, that allows for serendipitous discovery of content, right? Because um, there are set sort of content patterns that each user has, right? And you would like gaming content or shopping content or lifestyle, travel, so on and so forth. But how is it that you are able to understand your user better and actually surface content they, that they may not be actively looking for? And I think developing that understanding of a user uh, will automatically reflect in brand love, right? Because if you are able to add value to their life, create relevance, um, then that is where you see love. And for us as a platform, that directly translates in, in very key metrics like uh, time spent, uh, session time, uh, engagement rates that we see, and that is what we aim to sort of keep uh, strengthening and deepening. So if I take that ahead, Sarvesh, what would you say, how do I reconcile between having quick results, because clearly we have to kind of keep the business going, so there are quick results that are needed, but at the same time builds the brand love, which is a long-term strategy. I don't think I can love a brand or love even a person overnight, that's very rare, and doesn't last either. So keeping that in mind, how do you kind of reconcile and keep a balance between the two? So. Uh for us, like, you know, we entered the digital space quite later than some of the uh, industry peers and we had some learnings when we were getting started. So we developed an internal model uh, called AAA Plus which is like purely focusing on, you know, uh, awareness, accessibility for the customers, consumers and um, then driving the acquisitions through it, adding, you know, value to all these three areas um, uh, simultaneously. For some quick results, you know, after doing some uh, initial performance marketing campaigns for driving business goals or brand goals, uh, what we realized was like, you know, uh, being omni-channel was, was not working out for us as a brand and that's where uh, we uh, created, you know, platform-based strategies and one of our approach was uh, we are backed by um, um, two of the largest PSU banks, so we had like our core customer database is very strong. So we curated personalized WhatsApp campaigns uh, for our quick uh, business goals and that uh, really showed some good results while um, um, our performance campaigns or Google Perf Performance Max or affiliates was building the lead pool, uh, the early acquisitions and conver conversions came from that personalized uh, um, WhatsApp campaigns which we were doing. And in terms of long term um, uh, you know, brand loyalty, you could say, or, you know, keeping um, your brand connected to the audience. Uh, we we uh, realized very early that data and um, analytics is going to be very important to understand your consumer, to have meaningful conversations, and that's when we started, uh, you know, developing our intellectual property, property which is the You Matter app. Uh, it's an overall wellness app, which... Um, which revolves around your physical wellness, your financial wellness, and your mental wellness. And it, it could be an everyday app for people. Uh, it has interesting things in the app, right from, you know, having your health vitals. Uh, you can, you can um, uh, have your, you know, smart watches connected to the app. 
you have um, curated yoga, you have uh, live wellness sessions. Similarly, then there are many resourceful blogs, articles, meditation, audios, free mental health assessment. Then further going into, uh, you know, uh, having financial literacy modules, because um, for the end user, financial as a subject gets uh, slightly complicated. So we are trying to, uh, uh, when you are selling life insurance or any financial products, there is only so much you have to, you can speak with your consumer. But we are trying to add value by creating this property. In fact, we did a, did a soft launch which uh, went successful internally for our customers and our partners and employees. Two months back, we are launching the app um, this month. So uh, we are aiming uh, that this app is going to be, you know, our, our uh, way to connect with the audience in the long run. I mean, Nash, would you want to add to that? I'm, how do you keep a balance between having getting quick results, which is relevant and important for business, but at the same time, you know, go forward with the long-term strategy of brand building? See, I think with the proliferation of media, there is so much of choice available. Every market is spoiled for choice. And this is across both traditional media as well as uh, digital media. To my mind, I think both these can run parallelly. It need not be either or. At any given point of time, for example, for us also, there might be at least 30, 40 different kinds of tactical campaigns where you are uh, uh, constantly focusing on trying to acquire customers and, and feed into your e-commerce channel or feed our retail stores of, from a query point of view. So that we qualify as, as performance. But at any given point of time, there are also campaigns where we run for our existing campaigns or like I said, uh, the uh, curation of content which is not necessarily trying to sell but trying to engage in and for us we want to stand or in, intend to stand for uh, building memories, lifetime memories for brands. And can I via all our messaging on a one-on-one on -one large format campaigns or we use a lot of connected TV also these days can we continue to pass on that message and these are, can actually happen simultaneously. It need not be one over the other is what I think uh, my personal Has one about. overpowered the other ever? Uh, not necessarily. I think increasingly. It would have been maybe five years, ten years ago. But today uh, you can actually run all these campaigns parallelly, micro campaigns. It's not never, earlier it was like you do two or three campaigns a year. Right now you can actually have Every month you can have a large high impact campaign, run it on digital or connected TV. At the same time, uh, through large programmatic advertising, search advertising, you can even have hundreds of other smaller tactical campaigns running at the same time. So to our mind, I think this is the best time to do that where you can actually run purpose driven campaigns at the same time at not very high scale, at within maybe medium budgets, unlike the past but at the same time also run tactical campaigns on an ongoing basis. Fair. Devika, you spoke about engagement and experiences that are important for brand love. One of my favorite recent examples is Barbie, which was launched like in 1959. It's still relevant because it's not only evolved, but it has used the emerging technologies perhaps in, in the best way possible to engage with the consumers and the audience. How do you think we, or as brands, uh, one should use these emerging technologies, one, to stay relevant, second, to engage, and create experience that's worthwhile? Sure. So, I think the first thing is to understand what is the user's engagement with a particular technology, platform, or app, as the case may be, right? And I, if for any, um, brand to be successful, it's important to understand that value equation and leverage communication and experiences that are built on that organic equation, right? So again, for instance, so on Glance, there are, you know, given that, sorry, so this will, is a bit of a segue, but Glance is not an app, right? Glance is a platform that is published in conjunction with OEM partners. And so therefore, uh, simple things like user flows or, you know, user actions to read an article or to, I don't know, download an app, play a game, etc. are uniquely constructed keeping the platform in mind, right? So, one, it's important to sort of leverage that organic user behavior 
to see how best um, you know you can plug into the user's existing behavior and thereby establish your value as a brand in that construct. The second thing, of course, is what is the relevance of your communication to that particular user, right? So uh, it is so. If you are theoretically looking at gamers, at, at a younger audience, at Gen Z, and if gaming is a key sort of interest area for them, then how is it that you are able to fit into that space organically and create messaging and content that would, you know, establish your value proposition without saying, hey, I like gaming too, you know, which is very in your face. So I think um, e leveraging that organic behavior ensuring that there is relevance of messaging uh, to the user and then trying to see how you can go over and above your you know performance led advertising or you know ad led behavior and see how you can leverage content to create that um, bond with consumers i think that's really really important Hashita, and I think do that's you want what to barbie did beautifully right oh it did amazingly contextual well. How, it's amazing that how all age groups love barbie even now i mean it's that's brand love in truest sense uh, Harshita, do you want to add something? So, regarding the emerging channels, it's all about to start with the, say, the user journey mapping. Might be some business, the turnaround time is shorter versus some financial product where the turnaround time for the, is for a few months. So, starting from how will the user interact with that channel? At what stage will he or she come to that channel? Like for example, someone coming to my website surely has a higher intent than someone scrolling through my social media. So we need to understand at what stage which channel is user interacting with. And accordingly the message, the communication, everything. For there are many emerging channels but is that utilized just for an information or that is to deep drive what are the pros and cons of this product, for example. Whether the audience is in market and thoroughly into researching about my product or is it just, I'll say Gen Z who after say three to four years will look for an insurance. So it completely depends and needs to be mapped thoroughly so that we are very le relevant to the, with the, our communication to the audience. Let me ask you a radical question. Leaving the brand that you own currently, tell me a, a particular brand that you love the most and that has evolved or changed over time and any a particular reason why you love it. Pick any brand that comes to your mind. Which is that one brand that you really think has built the brand, is loved by the consumers and thus loved by you and why? Coca-Cola. Sorry, I didn't... Coca-Cola. I okay. think they've done a brilliant job. They've taken their core proposition of happiness and they've been able to build on that for decades. And I think that is truly commendable. Uh, and take the core construct of happiness and build such relevant stories globally uh, for consumers that I feel I, I find very, very powerful as an advertiser and as a human being. Nice. Yeah, I think um, um, there are two brands which I, I keep closely following. One is Zomato and another, another, another is Swiggy. And these both brands, um, you know, keep, um, while that was a good point on, you know, having a long lasting brand positioning, um, these brands I'm seeing that they are creating relatable uh, content. And, you know, there are like these small snippets which are like quickly engaging and it's not just out there on their social media platforms, but you have the app, you get these notifications. Those are also equally engaging, and I feel they are doing a pretty decent job. Yeah, I, I actually agree. I would, would have said Zomato as well, because I think they do some amazing job in terms of content creation and not trying to actively sell and just engaging users uh, with topical content. But maybe apart from that, uh, what I would also add, maybe relatively boring, slightly on traditional brand, but Amul, I think, has done a great job over the years how they've tried to stay relevant in spite of such a huge pedigree and creating the topical uh, content. I mean, I, I know we've all looked for those Amul holdings everywhere, small little ad in newspapers, they're not trying to sell, they're just looking at topical uh, content and creating and giving it a little bit of twist. So I think Amul has also done a fabulous job in terms of how they are engaging users and creating topical content. To my mind, I think that's also uh, relevant. 
Harshita? So, I'll just like to quote an example so that Swiggy and Zomato, we get a better context. So, like for example, there was a discount offered by Zomato and Swiggy and the communication said, leverage before our CFO finds out. <laughs> so, that is the sort of content that really users engage with. When it says sort of match or something, the push-up notifications, like you want to watch match and not cook, order now sort of. So, the way they have leveraged the micro moments and also the contextual and it's not the same notification or same communication across India. If it's raining in Mumbai, their communication is for that Mumbai rains. So, I mean they have done a fab job and they are till date, you know, relevant at every point of communication and touch point. Here. My last question, I can, time's up, I can see that. So, but one last, what is that one learning you want to give to the audience out here when they're looking to build brand love for their consumers? Just one. I think everyone spoke about the fact that identifying your value to the user is really important. But I think uh, it's very, very important for brands to think about how are they driving discovery for their uh, respective brands. Uh, so there was Rohit Shankar on stage earlier uh, from Bain and he raised a very interesting point where mind space is equal to, well, that's what drives, right? So I think that's a very co important consideration. It's, while it's very, it's critical to identify who you are as a brand and what your value proposition is, but um, it's also equally important to be, to stay relevant and contextual and drive discovery of that value for your consumers. Anyone? I think, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so I think um, um, accessibility for the consumer or customer is one of the important uh, thing with the emerging platforms coming up. So I feel it's not just about communication, but when, the, when, the, when the customer comes on your ecosystem, uh, you need to uh, uh, have, you know, shorter journeys, uh, uh, shorter time frames and very easy, um, uh, easily understandable products out there so that um, the entire accessibility part of it, you know, is uh, convenient for the end user. I think for me, uh, and this is more of our, our own learning than this, and, and I know there is no right or wrong answer for this. I mean, there can be hundred ways of actually building it up for your brand. One big revelation for us at the risk of maybe repeating is we don't try to actively sell anymore. The idea is I don't, because there is so much of choice for consumers, uh, people will see through it when you, it's more of an active sales message versus what you're trying to do and trying to be relevant or more adding value to their life. So instead of trying to actively sell, is there something that you can, the message can enhance the value of consumers like can I add value to that that's our biggest learning in the last at least post pandemic I think one thing will be focus on the research your existing audience I mean a thorough research is very very important crucial to building a brand who your audience are how are they interacting how are they seeing your brand it might be you were targeting an affluent customer but then you discover that your data tells you that a non-affluent is equal market equal customer base of your uh, customers. So that is really important. I mean that research part, the homework, the background on fields not, I mean there is a saying that brands are not built in the office, they are on the fields. Well how you, people perceive your brand. So I think that research and homework, that groundwork is very, very important before you go and map out a strategy to build a brand. Thank you. With that, I think the panel comes to an end. I would end by saying what I said at the start. It's easier to love a brand when the brand loves you back. And uh, as I understand, there are multiple ways where a brand can love back its consumers. To that note, thank you very much for the conversation. Thank you very much for listening.